Welcome everybody. Today we want to talk about sustainability in the blockchain ecosystem, but also with a special focus on the CO2 footprint of Bitcoin, also including its compensation. We will therefore have a quite broad span of the topic from sustainability in a more general perspective, but also focusing on topics such as CO2 reduction in specific domains, in this case biofuels, but also the CO2 footprint and com uh, CO2 offsetting of uh, the Bitcoin blockchain. Before we start and before we directly want to introduce the analysts, uh, I would like to ask Benjamin to quickly present for two, three, four minutes uh, some slides of a publication we have recently been doing to exactly measure the CO2 footprint of Bitcoin, you know, to get a head start into the topic and also its implications. Benjamin, would you like to directly take over? Yes, sure. So hopefully you can all see my screen. Then yes, um, welcome everybody also from my side. My name is Benjamin Schaub. I'm a consultant at Intas Tech, which is a blockchain consulting company that focuses on the handling and integration of digital and crypto assets for financial institutions. And together with, with the Blockchain Center and Philip, and also with uh, Konstantin Lichti, Cedric Heid and Robert Richter, we um, created a model um, that allows for the compensation of um, the carbon emissions of Bitcoin. And we want to get the conversation going and maybe lay a common ground. So I will show some of our results shortly. Um, first of all, what is important when uh, we look at the um, carbon emissions of Bitcoin, we have to start with the Bitcoin electricity consumption as such. Therefore, we relied on the numbers of the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance. And then we translated this number into the carbon emissions of the Bitcoin blockchain as such. And we were able to do this by looking at the sources. Where, are the, where is the electricity coming from? We think it's crucial to really look at um, the energy mix of the countries that are involved in mining. And um, so we then came up with uh, the 38 megatons of CO2 equivalent for the Bitcoin network during the period from September 2020 and August 2021. And this equals then 0.08% of the worldwide uh, CO2 equivalents. And um, when we had this, we then had to, to think about a model, uh, a potentially standardized model for the industry that can be used by hopefully everybody. And um, we came up with a solution um, which, uh, where we focused either on the transactions, this is the transaction-based network usage, or on the um, ownership-based network usage. This means holding Bitcoin over a certain period of time. And here we have um, example, examples um, calculated where we can say, okay, um, during the time frame we observed an average transaction, for example, cost roughly around 370 kilograms of uh, CO2 equivalent. And if you would like to compensate this uh, via the European emission trading system, where we set um, a price of 50 US dollars per metric ton of carbon, you would then have to pay around 18 US dollars to compensate such a transaction. And on the other hand side, we came up with that uh, the holding of one Bitcoin can be associated with uh, approximately two tons of um, CO2 equivalents. And this would then in the same example, lead to an um, offsetting price of around 102 US dollars. Then maybe also to add this for the conversation, we think that when we talk about Bitcoin on ESG goals, for example, it's not necessarily fair to only focus on the environmental aspect. It is also necessary to look at other aspects besides the electricity consumption. So we think that our future work and others will also focus um, and try to uh, quantify, for example, what's happening in El Salvador, where Bitcoin became legal tender, because, for example, we can already see right now that more inhabitants have access to a Bitcoin wallet than have access to a regular bank account. And this, um, as we think, has to be integrated in such a calculation as well. Also, um, the, the governance structure of Bitcoin, also this is something which is important for, for future work. When we talk about the electricity sources, maybe just a short comment here, we can see that uh, miners are 
definitely going in the direction of uh, applying more renewable energy sources in their in their mining process. Uh, especially in the US, we can see that after the, the China ban of Bitcoin mining, a lot of um, miners relocate and they are trying to, to use renewable energy sources for their mining process. And we also think that um, they see this as an opportunity to maybe um, drive other mining pools out of business in long term, which rely on, on brown energy sources. Why did we do it? Um, this is also important for our model. We see a stricter regulation coming up in the European Union. Financial products will have to uh, disclose their, um, their sustainability profile. So we think that it is uh, risk and chances alike if you actively handle it and you do something against uh, or, or against the compensation of Bitcoin in your financial product, then you should be good. But if you don't take action, this could cause some trouble. And also our, um, our model reflects the different business approaches which are out in the market. Um, we have miners, custodians, exchanges, and asset managers. So a lot of um, business approaches which differ and uh, maybe one of the business approaches is more going in the direction of transactions and the other more in the direction of, of holding Bitcoin. So we wanted to also reflect this. And also, um, it is not only the case that you can get direct exposure to cryptos like Bitcoin. You can uh, also get indirect exposure through exchange traded notes, for example. And um, therefore, we tried to, okay, to come up with a model and this looks like, like this. So as I said, we started with um, compiling the energy of the network, then uh, translated this into the carbon emissions. And then uh, what you can see on the left and right hand side here, came up with formulas um, where we then really look at the transactions, means the, the, the size of Bitcoin transaction in bytes relating to the blo blockchain growth in bytes. And on the right hand side, you see then we focus on the ownership based network usage, meaning um, Bitcoins in custody or Bitcoins held in relation to the circulating Bitcoins available. And then maybe as a last uh, comment to get the conversation going, um, when we uh, look into the future, we see, for example, two scenarios which could be possible. One of them is that um, platform operators such as crypto exchanges could um, translate this into a business model like Lufthansa, for example, does this with flights right now. This would then mean that you could, as an investor, compensate your transaction before you conduct the trans transaction. And on the other, other side, we see a scenario where, where, for example, asset managers might um, buy green Bitcoin from, um, from mining companies who use renewables only for their mining process and might even pay a premium therefore, because they will then do not have any strings attached regarding the compensation. And this might also lead to a situation where miners or mining pools that rely on non-renewables might even receive a, um, a price below the current market value of Bitcoin. And with this, I would like to turn over to Philip again. Perfect. Thanks very much. As said previously, we do not uh, solely want to talk about the CO2 footprint of Bitcoin, but still it provides quite uh, some uh, insights into the topic and also why we should deal with it. Um, but please don't also take this number out of the context. Bitcoin is only responsible for 0.08% of the global CO2 footprint. So 99.92% have other sources. You know, this is also a fact, despite what uh, Benjamin has been uh, saying. The, the problem is there, but uh, the problem is even larger elsewhere. With this, let's directly jump into the topic. Um, maybe, Dominic, would you like to briefly present yourself and then we do the round and uh, please provide some information about you as a person, but also as your company? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Philip. Um, thanks for the invitation. Um, so I'm, I'm Dominic Polga. I'm the uh, head of ETP product management at Iconic. Um, Iconic is a crypto ETP issuer and an asset manager based in, in Frankfurt. My background is that I come from um, yeah, basically traditional ETF, ETP space, um, was a portfolio manager and then product manager at a large US um, ETF issuer where, where I was instrumental in building their digital assets platform. And um, yeah, at Iconic, I'm 
responsible for product management and, and product development. Uh, what we do is wrap digital assets basically into an ETP and making them accessible to, to traditional investors through um, exchange traded products um, that trade on, for instance, Deutsche Börse, et cetera, Euronext or uh, SIG Swiss Exchange. Perfect. Thanks very much. That was a good uh, brief introduction. Um, let's uh, move over to Sarah. Maybe you also please present yourself. Oh, um, the, mute, the mic is muted. So, sorry. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Hi. So thank you for the invitation. So my name is Sarah. I'm working on the by settlement and the settlement. We uh, produce a platform, uh, a local blockchain platform as a service. With our platform, we help people and organization, consortiums, and so on to reduce the risk regarding to the um, blockchain developing phase. And also we be an accelerator when helping to bring the, let me say, the software very quickly to the market. It is not, uh, we support a lot of use cases and industries, also the sustainability industry. And our product is helping to, yeah, let me say, to create Uh, sustainability projects very quickly because for sustainability projects we need a lot of um, participants with, uh, with, with them and so it's only a big challenge to orchestrate everybody and with uh, several governance and so on and so we help a little bit for also reach the sustainability uh, goals what we have defined in uh, several let me say, construction frameworks like ESG and so on. So I work there as head of the business development and as a solution and the business architect. Yeah. And our location is, uh, the headquarter is in Belgium. And then we have also locations in India and in Dubai and in Singapore, for example. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so, and with, let's uh, move over to uh, Thomas. Please also present yourself briefly. Yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation, Philip, and uh, it's a pleasure being here today. Uh, I'm Thomas from uh, BlockSize Capital. I personally have a background in traditional banking, where I started somehow with, with Commerzbank, then I, I changed to the consulting side, uh, focusing on financial services industry. And uh, what we are doing at uh, BlockSize Capital is uh, we, we are a technology service provider based in Frankfurt, uh, specializing in uh, the digital assets industry. Uh, meaning we provide uh, professional infrastructure for um, institutional market participants like banks or asset managers or brokers to get uh, access to the crypto market. But we also are involved in quite exciting projects right now, um, like um, an, a JV, which we have uh, with a US-based uh, company, a biofuel producer, which also leads to our today's topic, uh, CO2 reduction and uh, green Bitcoin and Yeah, I'm really looking forward to the discussion uh, and this exciting topic today. Excellent. And Benjamin, uh, to basically also um, add some words about you, you already have shown who you are, but maybe add for the, for the entire round, maybe two, three more sentences. Yes, of course. Thank you also, Philip. My name is Benjamin Schaub. I'm a former employee of the Frankfurt School Blockchain Center. And uh, as I said, yes, I'm working at Intas Tech, which is a blockchain consulting firm. Um, and currently we have a lot of use cases that we are working on, especially around the Electronic Securities Act here in Germany, also the Fund Jurisdiction Act, which allows uh, allocating um, of crypto into, into institutional funds, which is new in Germany. And then also one of our, our keys or key projects is um, the tokenization of fund units. Excellent. So we have a very broad field um, and to basically get this to a solid topic because it's indeed very broad. Uh, we discussed it previously that, let, that first of all, we define uh, sustainability. So concerning sustainability in the context of blockchain, Bitcoin, crypto and so on. Let's do a quick round such that everybody briefly present what sustainability to really show the breadth of this entire field. Um, yeah, maybe Thomas, would you like to get started? Yes, thanks. I, I mean, uh, sustainability in, in, as in a general is, uh, in, in my opinion, a quite broad and complex topic and providing different layers of, of uh, different yeah, uh, levels of, of sustainability. And for me uh, personally, 
of course, uh, energy consumption as a component of sustainability or the key component should be taken into consideration for each and every uh, production process. Uh, always uh, trying to uh, yeah, keep the level of, of energy consumption, of course, as low as possible. And, and this also affects, of course, uh, blockchain technology. And for, for ex example, the Bitcoin blockchain and the Bit Bitcoin network itself, we often have the criticism of, uh, of course, high energy consumption of the network. But however, I would say, uh, we, we always have to keep in mind the, the relations here, because uh, I mean, as you mentioned before, uh, Benjamin, in your study results, showing that, uh, for example, the Bitcoin network is providing some new um, financial services to the world and, and is, is fostering, I mean, financial inclusion, for example, for El Salvador and for other countries as well, where millions of people now get uh, more and more um, services provided by blockchain technology and, and Bitcoin in that case. So, so we always have, in my opinion, to take into consideration uh, what is the, the new service added or the value added and what uh, may be older uh, financial services industry systems that are running today in, in like thousands of banks are uh, also um, yeah, consuming some energy and are maybe, um, can maybe reduce their consumption in the future due to um, new innovations. A second component for me is, of course, the, the CO2 reduction uh, topic where we have the carbon offset uh, that, of course, has to be reduced. And uh, here it is, from my uh, perspective, quite uh, important that sustainability can be a driver for innovation there, because uh, by um, having a clear result, like in your study before, you've shown what is the, the, bio, the CO2 footprint of, of Bitcoin, for example, then we can, having those figures, we can, of course, optimize the whole uh, value chain, the whole production process to get they're uh, a lower CO2 offset in, as a result. So um, sustainability there is uh, for me clearly a driver for, for innovation and for yeah, moving ahead and, and uh, going uh, better and, and more efficient in the industry. And lastly, okay. I would say also from, a financial, also from a financial services perspective, it's quite important because you see right now uh, more and more investors taking ESG criteria really seriously into consideration when thinking about uh, investing in different asset classes. And they clearly have a look at the uh, CO2 footprint and the ESG footprint of all those asset classes out there when deciding where to invest. So this is also a, a component of uh, sustainability, which is a really important one and which is getting more and more important when uh, thinking about technology and thinking about maybe uh, yeah, cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology in total. Yeah, can, can you add one more sentence on the biofuel uh, project and the CO2 reduction? Because this is something we would like to focus on later on also. So how, what is it you're doing there in the area of CO2 reduction, blockchain and biofuels? Yes, of course. So we founded um, a JV um, with a US-based uh, biofuel producer, which is NASDAQ listed, comp listed company. And they initially had the problem that they are yeah, providing biofuel. And if when, when buying biofuel and using it, you, of course, have a part um, in reducing CO2 offset, right, by, by using those uh, renewable in a kind of yeah, green energy, green fuel. Uh, but the, the, the big question was how to prove that the, the fuel produced is really biofuel. And there we came into uh, this uh, kind of exciting project where we uh, designed a, a process, a, a DLT blockchain based process, really proving and tracking along the whole uh, value chain that the biofuel is really I mean, produced under, under consideration of green, um, green yeah, standards and um, uh, tracking this and uh, making it really transparent to uh, the, the end user and to the buyer of, of this uh, biofuel. This is one component of, of this project. And a second one would be how to uh, make it, how to uh, tokenize carbon offset rights and make them uh, tradable later on in the secondary market, which is also quite an exciting uh, component okay. and which also leads to a reduction, of course, if you have to pay a price for, for consuming. Uh, yeah, that, 
That was excellent, excellent because uh, so therefore, you know, you are the expert on so CO2 reduction. We will need this later on to basically keep this uh, story aligned. Uh, so, uh, Dominic, what, what have you been doing or what are you doing in the field of sustainability uh, and uh, uh, CO2? I think uh, Thomas actually uh, went went quite broad with uh, with how how things are seen and I think uh, taking this holistic approach is is right like very simply how how do you define sustainability right it's living without uh, with, within one's means without um, harming any future generations and and looking at that with with energy expenditure across various um, technologies um, or, or innovations um, is is important um, what we've um, or the approach that that we have taken in terms of uh, sustainability is is to look at um, yeah together with with the Frankfurt School and, and Interstech um, and, and Benjamin in, in particular here um, is, is basically finding a methodology to calculate um, the carbon footprint of um, of a Bitcoin ETP that is um, that is trading um, and um, I think that's where this um, this methodology basically came up. What can we do to um, to offset uh, the carbon footprint of of the product that um, that uh, we currently have, um, and what can we do to um, uh, drive attention to this, and what can we do to um, yeah make this um, make this a topic that um, that people talk about in the future. Perfect. So this basically to summarize, then you are the expert for uh, also CO2, offsetting CO2 compensation, uh, for example, and in particular uh, with the Bitcoin network. And now over to you, uh, Sarah, what sustainability for you and what, precisely speaking, have you been doing in the field, which is now outside Bitcoin, more generally speaking? Yeah, from the generally point of view, <clears throat> for me, is sustainability more to concentrate on the essential for the consuming only what we really need, for example. So that I know this is a big difference regarding to Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency, right? But also we have had to create a trust between the um, verifiables uh, and, uh, and the guarantee and the requirement and the obligations and the rights for all this production and goods what we, what we produce. Uh, so that that I got to trust that it is really sustainable, right? When in the Bitcoin, for example, Bitcoin is for me the starting point for the blockchain technology, right? It is the, the, the source of that. And blockchain technology or distributed ledger technology can help to support sustainability projects. And I think we are, so we are discussing here at the moment based on an, let me say, uh, a theme which we use for some um, comparing with blockchain is, is equal to, 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 to Bitcoin-like. But if I look on the real world at the moment, we produce products, we produce helpers to, to, uh, to uh, produce um, goods and, 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 and food and all this stuff, which is not really sustainable. For that, we also need energy. We also produce uh, CO2. And uh, then I must ask me, um, <laughs> what is the great, uh, the, which damage is, is greater, the Bitcoin or the, the products what we use, which is not sustainability. And we, you, we need also a lot of energy uh, there. Right, and so I think sustainability is outside from the crypto world. Um, it's it's necessary. We have, give you one example. We have several clients they are using in this sustainability field, and one of them is uh, they have created a DNA for for cheese. So that they create a certificate on this DNA. That means they have um, based on the microbiology bacteria, they can create a DNA, a DNA and so they can, yeah, they can check if the cheese is coming from the real location which we we, we describe. So it's a up and seller, it's an up and seller, yeah, because this is 
a, a small example which we can create seasonality because the consumer at the end, if they will buy an Upton seller and then they like the Upton seller and said, I only will buy an Upton seller. And so we can give them the trust based based on this uh, on this certificate. And this, I think, is not only to, to, to check if the product is the product, but we can also bring more and more information regarding the trust. And so uh, we can also regarding the trust that everybody is let me say, is using the regulatories, what we have created and all the preventions rules, what we have created. And so that we have this, let me say the ESG scoring is one of the, of the big theme, which we found in, the, in uh, a lot of manufacturing roles, supply chain roles and so on. And this is for me a big or a general way to talk about seasonality. The Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, definitely we have here uh, to ask us if we need it really. So yeah, we need it really because we can change our society. We can we can change the world in a in a in a different ways to make it a little bit fair. And but the Bitcoin, I think it is only one part from a lot of other parts which we create uh, CO2 and our other let me say uh, climate climate dangerous um, parts. Yeah, sounds excellent. And uh, with this, I think we can have um, like a little yeah, summary at this point of time saying that sustainability and blockchain can go hand in hand. In hand. Um, it's about tracking the origin of goods, of course. It's about uh, Bitcoin as a uh, CO2 producer. It's about CO2 consumption, CO2 reduction, and so on. So there are many, many, many aspects where blockchain uh, can meet um, sustainability. I think this will be very interesting topic in the future. And we from now on, we would like to focus on specific uh, problems out there. So first, when we pre-discussed this panel round, we talked about the, uh, the key blockchain area, which is double spending. So how can blockchain with its aspects or feature of preventing double spending, how does this go hand in hand with regard to say, sustainability? Who wants to take this question? Thomas, please. <laughs> Maybe I can add something. Yeah, I, I mean, when talking about sustainability and uh, yeah, opportunities to uh, reduce, for example, CO2 offset and, and uh, make the, the CO2 footprint, uh, yeah, make, uh, decrease uh, this one, then it's, it's, of course, important to trust in the system. Yes, if, if you would like to invest, for example, into a bio biofuel, let's say, then it's, it's really important to have the trust that this is really biofuel and it's not like fossil, usual fossil fuel that, that is in there. And there the blockchain technology is a wonderful uh, technique to um, support the whole uh, value chain in the regard to uh, tracking each and every step and record this immutable on, on the blockchain to make this uh, visible to all yeah, to, to anyone that would like to audit afterwards what was the history of this specific uh, part of biofuel. This um, is, is a wonderful example. I, I think uh, what advantages this te technology also brings in the field of sustainability. Yeah, that makes very much sense. Basically, double spending is, uh, I think, very important in case you're talking about CO2 absorption, but or, uh, even more so um, uh, CO2 uh, consumption. It really makes sense to think about how uh, to have a specific asset which cannot be booked twice, which can, where double spending does not occur to really increase transparency and also reliability from the um, people's or societal societal view, right? And another topic where we thought uh, we, it's, it's worth to discuss is the topic of greenwashing. Uh, we had quite some uh, news in the media where companies have done greenwashing, and I think this is still a topic going on. So what's your take on this? How can blockchain technology help here uh, to avoid uh, or prevent uh, greenwashing? Who, anybody wants to take this question? Sarah? I think <clears throat> the blockchain technology can help here. So normally we said with the blockchain on the LT technology, we bring the trust. But the trust we can only bring if we, let me say, yeah, that who is who is checking the, the creation of the certification. I give you an example. 
In the building industry, we have a certification, the C2, the cradle to cradle certification. That means uh, building companies should only use the um, sustainability building blocks like walls from, uh, from wood, which are earned by, um, by sustainability ways, right? This certification was created from a Canadian company and the certification uh, process is done manually based on a questionnaire paper. So I ask me, is this sustainable or not? Because they, you can wrote everything what you what you need for the for the creation of your of your certificate, but no, if I have nobody is checking there, and and if this uh, if this the let me say the the reality if we found on on the paper, then I must ask me if we have really the trust here, and so I think. If we go back to our case with, with this cheese, with the microbiology. So they are at the moment, actually they can uh, yeah, give you the trust, how many liters milk it comes from the cow, from which location in, in Swiss. And then yeah, this is automatically process. You know? So we don't have a lot of human um, actions inside this process. And it's in a small process with, let me say, a small count of participants. I think if we have processes, which we have not, uh, not uh, a small or close community uh, from the production, then it was at the moment actually very, very strange to bring the sensibility to the blockchain. The blockchain technology by itself, it helps because we create the certification, we we decrypted the certification. We don't can change the certification. This is a trust, but we must work on that. That if the let me say we if we enter the data and and we bring the um, <clears throat> the the, so the parameters that we are really work on the on the rules and everything, uh, then we must go more to the automation in the processes for the sustainability because every human action is a risk in this. And so I think blockchain and DLT technology is helping on his natural way because we can provide data very quickly and very easy and very cheap, but the qualifying and the quantifying of the data, we must, we, we must do it by ourselves outside. And here we have, let me say, yeah, in our society, we have this, this, this double standards, right? So um, as long as we discuss climate protection at a campfire, uh, we only <laughs> ask us if we are also really in the, in the right discussions, right? That is my, my point of view at the moment. Yeah, and with this, I think we are uh, at the exactly next uh, topic where uh, we wanted to talk about the diffusion of responsibility, right? So who do you think is ultimately responsible to produce uh, sustainable business models, or sustainable business operations? Um, this also applies to Bitcoin mining and so on. So what would you say ultimately who is responsible here for doing this? Because of course, you know, everybody would now say that everybody individually is responsible. This is perfectly fine. But as you said, Sarah, um, it, it's just, it just feels weird when we are discussing CO2 reduction at a campfire. Uh, that just doesn't make sense, right? So yeah. who is responsible here? Is it the capital market? Is it politics? Is it the European Commission? Is it some inter in international institution? Uh, maybe you can add some information here and then we do the entire round for everybody. Yeah, I think, I think it is the complete society, right? So I, th I believe that that we should think about, let me say, the our society organization. At the moment, we are working with in a competitor field. So everybody need money, everybody need revenue, and in a in a to reduce the climate, uh, 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 the CO2 footprint and, and the offset and all this stuff, we need that we are motivated to collaborate more. And so I believe we had, if I look on our, uh, on our technology, uh, we talk here about a distributed network, uh, but we are trying to, to 
bring our central based mindsets and our central based um, process structure into a distributed world. And from my experience over the last six years, that doesn't fit. So we should think about to use, for example, we discussed this, by the way, years long, uh, the decent-related autom autonomous organization structure, uh, which means that we create uh, the, the collaborations directly based on a smart contract and uh, is transparency. And we need the transparency because transparency brings us the trust. This is the basic for the trust. And, and if we don't do that, so it is not really trusty if I know uh, yeah, it's this. <laughs> the certification was created based on a on a paper, or you, who is uh, everybody is is uh, has a multiple choice <laughs> questionnaire filled out, or what? And if I don't can can solve this issue, then I think it is up to to everybody. It's not only the politicians. It's also for the consumer. If we from the from from the consumer side. Uh, if you go to the uh, to the shopping mall and you will buy a fish, and one of them they cost ten euro and it's a, it has has a sustainability uh, certification, and the other one they cost five euro and they don't have a certificate. And at the moment, actually, a lot of people will buy the five euro fish, yeah, because this is in our in our in our mind, and this we have to change, and this we have to let me say. Uh, we need the, the, the incentive and the motivation to use uh, an other structure. And this yeah. can, this must, comes from the regulation, this must comes the initiation also from, from, from a higher level, but also from everybody. I, I would agree here. Um, the individual component is very, very important, but probably we need some more, um, yeah, regulation from a higher side uh, to basically... Yeah nudge people in a specific direction. Benjamin, I mean, what's your take uh, from this perspective of Bitcoin mining? You know, Bitcoin miners are visible. You don't see them where they are exactly sitting. So they can basically do whatever they want to. How, what, what can we do? How, how does it could work uh, to basically improve the CO2 footprint of Bitcoin? Because I think we are all sure here, Bitcoin is here. Bitcoin will not go away. Even though when Ethereum comes with proof of stake and so on, the Bitcoin network will remain. There is a reason why El Salvador has chosen Bitcoin and not Ethereum. So uh, this is all there and therefore Bitcoin will stay here for quite some years. Therefore, we need to deal with this topic. So how, what can, can we do or who, who basically is in charge in terms of responsibility, Benjamin, uh, to change the CO2 footprint of the Bitcoin network? Well, I think in the Bitcoin network, the problem is a bit different than comparing it to the society as such, because when looking at Bitcoin, 90% of all Bitcoin have now officially been mined. So we would have to take this, um, if we look at it from the polluter pace principle retroactively and would have to, to charge them basically for what happened in the past. And also the data that was available in the past is probably uh, way worse than the data we have right now. So I think um, looking into the future, I think for Bitcoin, the, 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 um, the road is quite clear. I think uh, more and more miners are engaging this topic. They see it as a chance. They all um, try to get certificates um, for their renewable energy mix. And I think that uh, especially Bitcoin, while being criticized that much, can actually pave the way for other assets as well, because the problem with Bitcoin is here, uh, the, but the problem is probably also there with other assets. Where when you look at gold, for example, um, um, then this is a completely different game, but not a lot of people talk about gold because um, gold has always been there and it's, it's uh, you know, um, let's not question that. So I think Bitcoin and digital assets have the, have the possibility while providing some data, which is um, digital, to really calculate and then make uh, things transparent. So I think when it comes down to Bitcoin, we will see in the next five years that the mining pools will have to use renewable energy sources because um, to get also back to the question, I think um, it is now time and all publicly um, clear that the, it all is about the end user consumption in the end. Yeah, the, the pressure has to come from the end user. Of course, the end user needs some help from the politicians, but then um, the end user 
must must uh, pressure the the platform operators and also um, platform operators are then in my opinion also in charge because they have the possibility they have the clients and they can um, also um, implement it in their business model as such um, as i said before um, lufthansa for example does not have to compensate the the co2 um, equivalents for the passengers. It's the passengers themselves um, who can decide to do it or not. And I think, for example, really questioning the people and directly ask them, would you like to offset this or that? This could um, easily make a, make a decisions um, change. For example, uh, we all of us uh, think for, uh, streaming services are as a given, and um, but these data centers also have a large footprint. No one is talking about that. So uh, let's imagine Netflix asks you before starting a, a, a movie, would you like to compensate this movie? And um, I think that this is a long way to go. But um, to get back to the question, I think platform operators um, are, are the key for really making um, a difference to um, how the system is working right now. Yeah, I think this is an interesting point. What, what about uh, uh, Iconic and uh, Dominic? What about your uh, take on this? Because yeah, sorry, sorry for for dropping off. Um, I, I, it seems like I have a very uh, stable internet connection uh, at home. But, Maybe um, saving some CO two. <laughs> yes, um, but I, I want to add on on something that that Benjamin said, or actually the uh, two points. Um, I think Bitcoin has um, or, or the whole. Um, carbon offsetting narrative has has come to the forefront um, this year, right? With uh, when Tesla started acquiring Bitcoin, and then all of a sudden Elon Musk supposedly realized that um, there's um, energy expenditure involved in in mining Bitcoin and, and mining transactions. So I think it must first be clear, really, to to critics what the the value of a sound money like Bitcoin. Uh, that is decentralized, that is permissionless, um, what value that has on, on society. And, and maybe it is really worth expanding that much energy, 0.08% of the global energy consumption, um, uh, to, to put it back into perspective. Um, so that, that would be my, my first addition and, and maybe like really try to change that narrative um, that Bitcoin mining or, or expanding energy to mine Bitcoin isn't bad at all, but it actually delivers a substantial value um, to people around the around the world. And then what can the uh, the network do to become more uh, yeah, energy efficient? You're seeing it day by day. First of all, miners are getting more and more energy efficient. Uh, and, and I don't mean the companies, I mean the, uh, the hardware that is getting um, um, yeah, more more efficient, um, but then also the miners that are looking at um, opportunities to use stranded energy to mine Bitcoin uh, that are using um, yeah renewable energy um, that that would have otherwise maybe be be stranded and um, maybe Benjamin you can add a little more insight into what has been going on uh, over your research where miners have relocated from China. Um, um, in fact, was Canada and, and the US and, and also Kazakhstan, which probably has an energy mix um, that's, that's not that preferential, um, but, but Canada and, and the US, especially um, um, yeah, Texas, which, which has a, a large uh, percentage of their grid being, being renewables. Um, so long term, I think miners will choose to go where um, they can use energy most efficiently um, where they can get the cheapest energy and when um, yeah renewables um, will become the cheapest form of energy because they um, they basically have a marginal cost of production of yeah near zero um, if you if you exclude maintenance costs of uh, let's say solar panels or, or wind turbines um, uh, yeah that that on the um, maybe mining side and uh, and my remark to what to what Benjamin said uh, on the perception of Bitcoin. Um, what does Iconic do? Um, uh, yeah, we are basically um, offsetting our our footprint that has been generated by um, um, by our product um, and exactly um, 
by um, not going there and, and having this producer pays principle because we are not the producers of the Bitcoin that we hold, um, but we are using the, um, the Bitcoin network in a way like a passenger is using a, uh, an Airbus or a Boeing machine that has been acquired by Lufthansa and that can choose to comp compensate the, the CO2 footprint. And that's exactly what we're doing using um, Frankfurt Schools and Interstack um, methodology. So you guys kindly calculated our CO2 footprint um, and, and we are choosing to offset that by um, acquiring CO2 certificates. Um, maybe also differentiate, maybe a, a difference between um, buying, uh, yeah, random pollution certificates or, or actually supporting um, proper projects um, for, for this offset, we've chosen to, um, to start with a, um, yeah, again, holistic pro project in, in Brazil um, that is looking uh, to make lives better of, of a community in, uh, in the Amazon jungle. Um, and uh, yeah, basically by preserving um, the the forest there and um, yeah, keeping keeping the the green lung of the earth um, green. Yeah, sounds good. But uh, let let me let me try to summarize uh, the, the key points what you have just mentioned. So first of all, Bitcoin can most efficiently be mined uh, when you have low electricity costs and. For example, hydropower and other renewable energy sources are among the cheapest electricity sources. And therefore, you say that Bitcoin has a natural tendency to go on the long term towards some, uh, some kind of a greener profile. And I would also exactly agree here. Then uh, that's I think that's one point. And secondly, I think you also said that it's not just a CO2 footprint. You need to balance this with the generation of a sound monetary network, uh, because we indeed see that in El Salvador, hundred thousands of people now benefit uh, from this transaction network because suddenly they have some kind of bank in their in their pocket the bitcoin on the smartphone and so far more people have uh, this kind of us dollar bitcoin bank in their smartphones in comparison to people having bank accounts with legacy banks in the past year so there is also another um, component to esg and sustainability not just the CO2, uh, I think I got, got you right here, right? But, but still, let me let me pose one upcoming question on additional to this. Right now, you know, December 2021, and I think this will stay for a couple of months like this, uh, we do have the issue that, you know, that's just the numbers, the CO2 footprint of Bitcoin is there and cannot be changed overnight, um, even though the long-term uh, outlook might be different, right? So what's your opinion here? What can regulators, what can we do and so on to change this? Because an anonymous Bitcoin miner who has access to low cost electricity from some depreciated coal generation power plant, right? Why should he change? You know, why, why should he change? And nobody tackles him because he's somewhere on earth and we do not see him. So do we need to bring miners or mining companies to the stock market and then basically uh, have ESG regulation on behalf of investors to then basically drive mining power to IPOs or IPOing mining companies, uh, which, for example, getting publicly listed at the stock market in Canada. Is this the right way, or do you see any other possibilities, Dominic? Yeah, because because we see this kind of diffusion of responsibility. Everybody says, uh, "Well, it's not me. He he needs to do it, or he needs to do it." Uh, and this approach is wrong. And this approach is wrong. And at the end of the they, um, we have this diffused responsibility. I think uh, the, the Bitcoin maximalist answer would be that uh, the market will take care of, of this approach and you don't need a regulator to tell you exactly that, um, that you need to um, offset your, your Bitcoin that, that you've mined. Um, I think, like I said, over the long run, um, miners will converge to the most efficient energy sources, which um, uh, which will be um, renewable energy. Over over the short run, um, yeah, I, I, I think it it's such a tough discussion to to have um, because 
yeah, obviously you want to have some short to to midterm effects, but what is the task of of a, of a regulator? Uh, or if if you take a look, for instance, what the ECB is um, is doing with their um, with their inclusion of green bonds, um, is that the the task of the the ECB to um, to foster um, green investing? Um, I would clearly say that it's not, but others may have different views and. Um, and, and regulators probably don't do the right things always. <laughs> no, I, I think this is right. But you know, but but you at Iconic Funds, you're all you're also tackling this topic. You basically you, you have not been forced to by anybody, but you're still tackling this topic. And uh, one expectation would here that uh, basically there are ESG conscious yeah. investors outside, exactly, and then they might rather take your product in comparison to others. So in this case. The pressure from the capital market side does work, right? For for us, it's um, it's a feature of the of the product that comes at no additional cost to the the investor. So um, actually, if you um, if you're not into um, yeah compensating carbon emissions done by the Bitcoin network, then you're not worse off by by purchasing a product issued by by Iconic. Um, in, in fact, yeah, you, you may even be be better off. Um, but uh, yeah, like I said, it, it's a feature of the product. If someone um, or investors who are turning more and more um, ESG conscious are choosing to um, to look at Bitcoin ETPs in particular um, by um, by their offsetting uh, methodologies, then yes, um, yeah, Iconic is taking. Uh, that I approach, um, but I think yeah, because we we want to we want to lead in this um, in this matter and and not be followers. We actually want to offer our clients the possibility yeah. to to choose um, offsetting. Yeah, perfect. And th there has been one question coming up in the chat on on YouTube. Uh, I think uh, I, I also have to post this to you, Dominic. How can an investor? Uh, basically identify whether the green is the green argument is actually really there and it's true or whether it's simply a marketing argument you know how, how can you basically prove this um, I guess the the question is how transparent we are with um, with how we are offsetting um, and um, yeah so the the idea um, well, Long term is that that we are going to post the um, the projects that we are supporting on on our website um, and and being transparent with that. I think right now you can obtain proof um, if if you want that by by emailing us and we can send you our certificate that we have actually purchased and that we have burned the um, and not not physically burned to uh, to not cause any carbon emissions but um, redeemed the. Um, the CO2 uh, certificate, which will basically prove to you that um, yeah, we we have participated in in this offsetting and supported a particular project. Um, yeah, happy to happy to share that with anyone who who um, reaches out to us. Um, for now, obviously, this is upon request only, um, but we will definitely um, uh, share further insights into which projects we we are supporting and how we're doing it in the future and, and if you sorry um, and, and if you are, are really interested then read the study that um, that Interstech and Frankfurt uh, School Blockchain Center uh, um, published um, and um, yeah maybe you get to the same result as um, <laughs> as they did yeah, Benjamin, would you like to add something here about how uh, how basically uh, investors, consumers, the society can basically differentiate between really being green as a company, as mining company, blockchain company, whatever, and uh, just the pure marketing arguments? No, I think therefore there will be um, right now companies like us or others emerging which really audit as a third party products and um, companies like, for example, Iconic. I think this is uh, the, the path is here also clear, especially in, in the European Union, as I tried to show initially, um, the regulators um, are coming yeah, for financial products and um, 
Um, next year, we will see that um, the sustainable finance disclosure regulation will kick in and require uh, financial products to uh, disclose uh, adverse risks. And so I think the, the carbon emissions as such will be a huge topic, not only for Bitcoin, for other assets as well. And um, this will not be, uh, companies will not be able to prove or handle this without proper assessment of, of auditors. Yeah, perfect. And Thomas, what about you? Uh, you talked about biofuels. Of course, you can, you can simply argue that, you know, these biofuels, they are biofuels. Um, but how do you prove to the market that they are real bio exclamation mark fuels and not any random crazy fossil fuels? You know, how, how is this being done uh, with you? That's, uh, that's quite an interesting story. So what's been tracked is really the whole uh, chain, meaning from uh, feedstock production and transportation, uh, yeah, going on to the fuel production and, and transportation of the fuel and also integration of yeah, using existing tracking systems there along the chain and to really mm -hmm. have like a, a protocol, an immutable protocol to, um, to trace this after, to track this afterwards. And this is also quite interesting when tokenizing such uh, carbon offset rights because there's the same question how can you be sure that this is really a, a carbon offset right based on the green green production and, and uh, esg and criteria so what, what you would be able as an investor is uh, really to go down in the deep uh, details uh, you, you can really quite see um and that uh, the, 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 the origin, meaning uh, a satellite picture, for example, um, of, of the area where with this carbon offset certificate was based on, what was the underlying for this? And this is uh, really amazing. And yeah, I, I think this comes more and more to attention also on the investor side and also your idea you mentioned in, in the very beginning about a green Bitcoin labeling is something that uh, will create some incentive and, and a pressure from the capital market as well for miners uh, coming back to the Bitcoin topic uh, to, to produce more, to use more renewable energies while mining Bitcoin, for example. Oh, sounds good. Sarah, what about you? How, how can a settlement, for example, help to uh, differentiate between green marketing and true green business models, business processes? So settlement can help uh, that we, yeah, that we provide, the, let me say, the platform which we can collaborate very quickly and you can orchestrate every participants very quickly and you can also create for example the QR code what you know very quickly and but if i heard the last research regarding to your questions i think from my point of view that we can have let me say more trusty uh, regarding for the for the uh, carbon footprint carbon emission and also for the bitcoin for example why we don't create uh, we don't cre create a QR code which is presenting that? For example, we can we can have uh, the, the the checking regarding the power uh, creation. We can check in regard the proof of of stake or of rock what we use. And based on this parameter, we create a QR code. We present it on the on the marketplaces on the exchange, and then everybody, investors, consumers, can scan this QR code and can decide by himself if I buy this or not. Because if I see this is, let me say, in the green field regarding to the uh, CO2 consumption for the climate prevention, all this stuff, or I have the red light and then I said, okay, I buy this uh, directly. If I buy the, the only Bitcoins which are in the green field, then I give, let me say, an, an uh, incentive uh, back guarantee or motivation coin, whatever, that I, that I be motivated to use this, right? And so I think, Based on this on this solution, we can we can manage then a lot of products. Um, but the point is, we need a complete automated process there without a human action. And then I have to trust. And from the technical aspect, uh, we can do that today. But we will we will, and we we must be motivated to to bring this on the market. And so because I believe at the moment. A Bitcoin is, is, let me say, an, <clears throat> um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a theme which, which is only in the press, but a new cryptocurrency we don't talk about is this is the NFT. And here I see Maury Morris because here the NFT was created on, let me say, on infrastructure, uh, which are more, 
not using the sustainability uh, uh, energy and so on. And so I think if we, if this is this must also not comes from the regulatory. This must come from from the producer, from the from the product, or here from the uh, from from Bitcoin by itself, for example. Yeah, I think this uh, what you bring up is a very interesting argument uh, because indeed uh, you have to streamline processes, you have to make them fully digital. You need to basically uh, remove any interference from human beings, uh, fraud, or other systems, and so on, uh, to have your purely digital systems because only then you can really prove. Yeah. The origin of goods and so on. That's an interesting point. I it, I wasn't aware. Uh, that this is interesting. Kill, kill, the, mi kill the middleman. Kill. <laughs> yeah, sounds uh, great. Maybe, maybe a question, Philip, um, from a um, uh, from a university standpoint. Um, uh, how do you solve the the Oracle problem? Like, how do you get the information from the real world into into the blockchain? Um, Yeah, I, I think you know there, there is there is this chain link approach out there which now has proven uh, to work. Um, um, they have basically decentralized the Oracle problem to multiple sources. Uh, I think Thomas, you're the expert here. Would you like to quickly explain it? Uh, it's fascinating and it does work. Um, and then I think we also have to to close down the, the session in a in a couple of seconds or minutes. Thomas, what's chain link? Yeah. Absolutely, there, there are really great yeah, approaches to, to ensure this uh, Oracle like a problem and have reliable data on the blockchain. You, you mentioned, Philip, the example of Chainlink. Uh, why uh, is, is this a, a topic of box accessibility? Because one, we are one of the, the largest uh, node operators, the Chainlink network, providing market data to the Chainlink network. And how this works is that they have like for, for each and every pair they have uh, like reliable market data and they ensure the trust by involving not only one data provider into providing the feed for this specific pair, but, but providing like 10 or, or more different data providers. They have ordered it before, of course, and they have to fulfill, uh, of course, hard criteria to be uh, listed at, as a provider there to get a, a trust or reliable result, a price in that case, uh, where you can rely on and which can be used, of course, by uh, smart contracts um, like Oracle data. Excellent, uh, good explanation. So with this, I think we are on the, on the final uh, line here. Um, maybe everybody, a quick round. What do you think happens with regard to this topic of sustainability and blockchain in, the, in, in next year, 2022? Is it st still just a topic for PowerPoint slides of consultants? Is there something happening in real? Do we see CO2 compensation happening in real life? Do we see CO2 reduction and compensation and offsetting and so on? Um, who wants to get started? Benjamin, what's about, what about you? We will see some of the biggest exchanges in the world addressing this topic next year. Interesting. So this would primarily address uh, the, uh, the Bitcoin uh, topic, right? Dominic, exactly. uh, what about you? Yeah, uh, I think slight modification. Uh, we will see um, a lot of regulators tackling this, uh, this issue in the next year. Um, you already see it in, in Sweden, um, where I think uh, the government has talked about banning Bitcoin mining um, because of the carbon footprint. Um, I think this will become an issue. Oh, I mean, Sweden is only the small example, right? Um, China, uh, <laughs> in the beginning of the year, probably the, the more evident um, player there. But um, I think it will become a hot topic. Excellent. Um, Thomas, what about you? What's your expectation? Yeah, I mean, right now, it's, um, it's one of the key points on, on the agenda of each and every country around, right? at least in Europe, also on the agenda of the European Commission. And it's, it's getting more and more attention on, on the investor side. So large, large funds now decide to only invest into ESG compliant investments so, or assets. So in my opinion, this will yeah, increase more and more in the next year and will come more and more Uh, on, on top, on, on the top level there. Excellent. And Sarah, the final word to you. Uh, what do you think <laughs> happens next year? I, I expect a lot of general uh, changes in different stages. On the, on the regulatory stage, I expect at the moment more and more pressure regarding to our uh, actuality regulatory lethal Kettenschutzgesetz, for example, ESG, SDFR, sustainability, and, all, and SDGs and so on. 
And so uh, we know uh, this regulatory should come in 23. So the pressure is there. So we, the, the, the companies are, have a lot of questions and, and they must change the business strategy, for example. Also, I expect that we have to change this regarding for the collaboration based on our DLT and uh, our distributed networks. And I think also, and I know, uh, we have changes in the technology. So more and more uh, chain protocols, new chain protocols is in front of our technical door, which is using not only the human uh, for confirmation, the consensus, which is more using the, the KI, the AI, for example, AI technology for confirming the consensus. And then we have also a little bit more trust and we have also a little bit more speed. And the combinations, what we see in the technology, look at the duck chains, so it's a combination from the Tangle and the DLT structure is coming more and more because we need this. We don't, we don't should forget that if we're growing in the participants, we need also more power. And uh, I think the, the, we have to, we we are coming closer regarding to the to the pro for the delivery for all these applications, and I believe also that platforms like us is uh, is absolutely important because the people they have to focus on the business and all to un to find answers and solutions for these questions, or not to stuck in the experimental phase how the infrastructure can work, right? This is my expectation for the next years. I think this was very, very solid. We, uh, we, we know that it's a very, very broad topic. I hope we did a good job with basically trying to compile sustainability with all its facets uh, and CO2 footprint of Bitcoin. And with this, uh, thanks for joining. And um, yeah, let's do uh, more topics of this round in panel discussions next year. And besides this, uh, we all wish you a happy Christmas and some silent days and weeks where nobody writes any emails. See you. Thank you. And uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.